Good morning, everyone. So I, uh, I'm going to start very quickly. I got to tell one General Milley story, uh, and there are many. Uh, General, <laughs> General Milley and I, uh, my first in-depth interview with General Milley was in the middle of where else but Afghanistan, uh, in a place uh, we may never all get back to called FOB Shank. And if you know it, it's a, in, back in the day, it was a, a, a sometimes very difficult place for troops to be based. We had arranged our interview. We had our camera. It was a nice, sheltered little location. On the FOB, General Milley walks up, looks around, sees a hill in the distance up against the security perimeter and says, well, let's go climb up there and do the interview up there. Um, it, what you learn with General Milley is when he starts climbing, a hill, mountain in my view, but it was a hill, and it's up against the security perimeter, the best thing to do is start climbing and keep up with him. <laughs> and even today in the Pentagon, I would tell you, uh, we have a really good opportunity this morning. General Milley, clinically impossible for him to spin. We know a lot of generals in the building. General Milley can't spin, he just tells you what he thinks. And so that's what I'm really looking forward to this morning. We're gonna talk very quickly. We're gonna, he and I are gonna run through a few items to sort of set the table, and then we wanna move very quickly to your questions and get everybody involved. And I hope you have a lot of questions, because if you don't, General Milley's likely to call on you himself and find out what you're that's thinking. I'm looking around the crowd right now. <laughs> Targeting. <laughs> Um, so, General Milley, you know, we're talking about the future of war, and I think most of us are familiar with your thinking that if you're going to look at the future of war, it starts with where you are today and how you view the threats out there in the world. It gets us to the question eventually of how much army is enough, how much army is too much, what kind of army. But let's step back and start with the threats and kind of have you walk around the world for a minute in what you see. Can we start simply with Russia? How do you view the threat the United States national security interests and the US Army faces from Putin's yeah. Russia? Uh, well, first, Barbara, let me first say thanks to you and <clears throat> Peter Berg and Anne Marie, my classmate. And uh, just for the record, she was in the uh, top half of the class, and I was in the half of the class that made the top half possible, so. <laughs> uh, that's the difference between state and defense, I guess, right? So, uh, but thanks for having me sure. here. Uh, you know, I, where I was in the back room there and the, uh, getting mic'd up, and I was watching the little poll everybody took, and I, I saw the, the threats in the countries that uh, uh, were out there. It was kind of an interesting set of results. Uh, the way I look at, you know, the world and the guidance I've gotten from uh, Secretary and others, uh, is for us to <clears throat> size, uh, structure, uh, train our forces uh, for essentially what I would, I would say four plus one. So uh, four specific uh, threats that are related to countries, uh, Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. And uh, then a fifth threat called counterterrorism. Uh, today's uh, specific organization might be ISIS, but it might be something else uh, down the road. So that, that's the general category. There's functional threats like cyber and others out there as well. <clears throat> With respect to Russia, uh, you know, I, I've tried to, over the years, study Russia. Uh, I had the benefit of some great education at Princeton from a lot of great professors and have just carried that through the years and, uh, in the military. Uh, Russia's faced with a series of internal challenges. Uh, they've got demographic, economic, uh, political challenges that they're facing. Uh, it's a country that has uh, been subject to land invasions many, many times in their history. You know, the Mongol invasions, Napoleon, Hitler, and so on and so forth. Uh, so they've got a set of internal challenges, and all countries operate in their own interests. Uh, and fear is a very real uh, sort of uh, sense inside the body politic of the, the Russian people, and that's stirred hard by uh, the Russian political leadership, I think, as well. Uh, so I think fear is a, a player in how they behave in the international environment. <clears throat> and then I think pride is a big factor as well. Uh, so, you know, they were, of course, a, a, a great power under the Tsars and, and then later under the Soviet Union, and, and the wall came crumbling down. Where, so they've got that, a, they want to reestablish pride. Where's that all leading them to well, today? So, so, what, so you got fear and pride operating, and they got, there's a lot of money at stake, there's a lot of interest. So all of that, put that cake mix together, uh, I think my read, not the U.S. government's read or 
anybody else's read. My read is that uh, they've put all those uh, data points together, and they said we got to make a comeback. And so about 2003-ish, uh, four-ish, five-ish, in that range, in that time frame, uh, Russia launched on a significant military modernization program. Uh, they changed their doctrine, uh, and most importantly, their behavior in the international realm changed from uh, a certain benign behavior relative to the United States interests from, say, 1990 to about 2003 or four or five, uh, and then it became aggressive. So Russian behavior today, uh, by the definition of international politics, is aggressive. They are invading sovereign countries with military forces or surrogate military forces, uh, which in the realm of international law is not right. And Europe hasn't seen that behavior since World War II in 70 years. So that's a major strategic shift of behavior of a major or a great power uh, in Europe. So that's a big deal. Uh, so behavior's there. Uh, you can't necessarily, you know, do Nostradamus and predict intent. You have to get into mind reading for that. Uh, but you can judge intent based on behavior. So their behavior from 2008 and the invasion of, of Georgia and then the Crimea and Ukraine and, and a whole wide variety of other things where they've used all kinds of tools of national power to intimidate neighbors. Um, that is an indicator, anyway, of intent. And then capability, their capabilities, conventional capabilities, are significantly better than what they were uh, in the 90s. And of course, they always have their nuclear capabilities. So put all that together, to me, that's a very significant strategic challenge. How much of a threat? I think it's a big threat. I've, I've said publicly in testimony, I think Russia is the number one strategic threat to the United States of America. And I say that for two reasons. One uh, is they have the capability, they are the only country on earth that has the capability uh, as an existential threat to the United States. They are the only country on earth with the capability to destroy the United States of America. Uh, other countries have lots of capabilities. Only Russia has that capability. Um, so that's significant in and of itself. But capability without intent is just capability. You have to match it to intent. And when you get into the world of intent, you're dealing in probabilities and you're dealing in predictive analysis. It's very difficult to figure out the intent of a foreign leader or foreign power. So you look at behavior as an indicator of intent. And recent behavior since 2008 is aggressive by the Russians. So I, I have to ask, and we'll move on to other subjects, but now you got me fascinated. Yeah. So based on what you look at, when you look at their military leadership, your counterpart, right. The General Dunford's counterpart, the right. chief of staff, when you look at the top leadership in the Russian military, are these people actually in charge? Are they decision makers? Or are they simply taking orders from Vladimir Putin? Well, I mean, uh, in charge of what? Well, I mean, they're in charge of the military. But there's no doubt in my mind that there's civilian control of the military in Russia. Uh, and Putin is the civilian who's in control. So um, Does the, anybody? These, the, the Russian military, I don't believe the Russian military <laughs> is a rogue military or anything that they're operating on their own. I mean, they're operating within the construct of Russian internal politics with civilian control. I guess I'm, that should refer, I should rephrase the question. Do, do they ever say to him, hmm, maybe that's not such a good idea. Here are all the, you know, like the Joint Chiefs do. You offer options, you offer ideas, you offer sure. suggestions. Or is the Russian military at this point now uh, a yes-man organization to Putin? No, I think, I, I mean, I don't know. I'm not in the meetings, I'm not in the rooms. and. Uh, and and uh, I would assume, I mean, I, the Russian military is a professional military, and I'm assuming that these guys would uh, uh, tee up the costs and benefits. I, I take it as a given that the Russian leadership is a rational actor. The, the, all the players are more or less rational actors. So I think they would, uh, I, I can't imagine them not uh, saying, you know, course of action one, course of action two, here's the advantages, here's the disadvantages, and our recommendation is, or something like that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, I give them credit for being professionals. So then let's move to North Korea. Sure. Your view, you said Russia was the only country that had the capability to destroy the United States. What's your sense of North Korea at the moment in terms of their intent on their weapons program and their capability and the threat they pose? Yeah, I think, I mean, not, we've been in a state of armistice since 1953, so we run the risk in a certain way of Groundhog Day, where tomorrow is going to look like yesterday in the last 70 years, where war doesn't break out on the Korean Peninsula. I don't know if that's such a great 
<clears throat> sort of mental attitude to be in. We take it for granted that the armistice will continue to hold and that war won't break out. If you look at <clears throat> Kim Jong-un and, uh, and his regime, I think there's a lot of things that have popped in the news and that indicate there's a variety of challenges going on inside that regime right now. Uh, there's a lot of external behavior that causes great concern. Uh, you know, you had the incident back in August. Uh, you had, if you go back in time to 2010, 2011, you had the uh, Chonan sinking, you had the Waipido Island incident. Flash forward, last August, you had the uh, border incident. Uh, January, you had a, a detonation of a very large explosion. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what type, but a very large explosion. Uh, the launching of missiles that uh, were putting things into space, but <clears throat> they could be dual-use missiles, who knows. Uh, so there's, you know, of course, all the rhetoric that, that happens. Now, some of this is routine in that it happens every year, and you sort of get lulled into complacency on it. Uh, but there, there, is a, there, there are enough differences that North Korea bears very close watching. Uh, the risks are very high. It's not an existential threat to the United States, but war in the Korean Peninsula, from a human perspective, would be catastrophic. Seoul is a city of 25 million people. They're 25 miles from the DMZ. There's a million soldiers on either side. Uh, you're looking at hundreds of thousands of artillery or rocket uh, fire that would land in a, in a city that has a population density four times New York City. Uh, the world has not seen that sort of human tragedy, that sort of violence, probably since the, the real huge battles of World War II. Uh, so uh, a war on the Korean Peninsula would be terrible in human terms. Strategically, uh, you can only imagine what it would do to the Northeast Asian economy uh, with Japan and China and, and, of course, South Korea. So there's all kinds of second and third order effects. So although it's not an existential threat, it's a, it's a very, very significant threat to vital U.S. national interests. Are you, how concerned are you that the U.S. is, in fact, a little too complacent, as you, the word you used, about the North Korean threat right now? Uh, I, I don't think that we in the military and the in Department of Defense, I don't think we're complacent. I think that uh, we have uh, maintained a very high levels of readiness, uh, forces forward, forces that can respond. So I'm 100 percent confident uh, that uh, whatever forces are going to be needed by General Scaparati in the Korean Peninsula in the event of an outbreak of hostilities, that they would be provided and they'd be provided on time. So I don't think we're complacent necessarily. I I'm just saying that the expectation that, uh, you know, there's going to be peace tomorrow or the next day or two weeks from now or two months from now or two years from now, uh, that can be uh, something that lulls you into tomorrow is going to look like today. That may, that, that's one place on Earth that that may not be the case. You never know with that situation. And the, the forces uh, that the North has arrayed, uh, those forces are always in a state of readiness that could launch some sort of conflict or incident that could escalate to a conflict very, very quickly, uh, much quicker than people you know, truly realize. So the North Koreans could at any point begin have the capability to begin hostilities. No doubt. Could they begin faster than we would see it, than we would know? No, we would know. You might not know, but we would know. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I know what reporting well, we I'll be doing. We will tell you, Barbara. We will tell you. <laughs> I think I have a few questions to ask around the Pentagon later today. Um, <laughs> We could talk about Iran, we could talk about the threat, but um, watching the clock, so I want to kind of jump ahead. You've laid out some of the threats. Weave in Iran, weave in the counterterrorism threat, but as you look at all of this, you have to deal with all of this as it exists today, as it may exist 10 years from now, and it gets to the fundamental question, how much army, what kind of army, your future, how much army is enough? How much army is too much? Yeah, so I mean, and you, you have Iran, you have China. Of course, the, the current fight, the fight we're actually engaged in physically on a day-to-day -day basis, kind of terrorism fight uh, against ISIS. So the challenge for us, challenge for the army and the military writ large, is we have got to sustain and maintain counterinsurgency and counterterrorist capabilities. Uh, we can't lose that which we've gained and learned over the last 15 years. We have to keep that going. Um, and my estimate is that we will be engaged 
in fighting terrorists or insurgents or building partner capacity of countries and friends and partners that are going to be fighting terrorists. Uh, I think we're going to be doing that for quite some time. Uh, I think General Dempsey, when he was chairman, publicly said something like 10 to 20 years. My predecessor, General Odinero, said 10 to 20 years, something like that. There's been other people who have said, you know, a long time. I think Secretary Carter testified to it. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know that anyone knows. Uh, I just think it's going to be a long time. So we're going to have to retain those capabilities. So that's, uh, as I look at how to size and structure a force, those capabilities are absolutely essential because that fight's going to continue. Uh, even if ISIS is destroyed, President's charges would destroy ISIS. I think we will destroy ISIS. But even if we destroy them, uh, radical terrorism doesn't magically go away. The conditions are still out there. And until and unless those conditions go away, radical terrorism is not going to go away. So that's going to go on for a while. And then you've got those four other situations, each of which uh, is unique in and of itself and requires certain capabilities uh, uh, for each one of them. So as I look at those, the capabilities required to either deter or defeat a Russian aggression uh, in Europe uh, or uh, to fight against the North Koreans. But now you're talking higher end type warfare. So you're talking some uh, forces and capabilities that are going to be able to do combined arms maneuver. Uh, you've got to be able to uh, operate in very, very lethal, fluid, dynamic environments. Uh, you've got to be able to operate uh, with air and other joint forces. Uh, so those are necessarily different type forces than you might fight against Earth. Uh, so you said how much, how big, and so on and so forth. Um, as I look at the the guidance given to us, it's all relative to risk. So there's no absolutes in any of this stuff. Uh, it's a matter of how much risk uh, the national leadership is willing to take, uh, and all I can do is offer my best military advice and say, this size force, you're buying this much risk. And the risk, I measure the risk in terms of uh, the size force, the troops sort of thing. Uh, the tasks that we've been asked to do, um, and uh, are those troops adequate to the task, the time it takes to do the task, uh, and then the cost relative to uh, not only money but cost and casualties, and, and all of that, put that mix in, and I come up with a risk assessment, and I give that risk assessment to the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman. So, based on the threats you see and the risk assessment. And I'm not going to tell you my risk assessment. <laughs> You know, well, what I've said, what I've said in testimony, it, what I said in yeah. testimony last week, <clears throat> was I think, given the the size of the United States Army, uh, the cap it's really not size. I mean, I mean, the numbers of forces is only one factor. Readiness is actually the more important of the factors. Uh, the, the the skills of the force, the leadership of the force, are those units that you have fully manned? Are they fully trained, and so on and so forth? So size is only one piece. And then you want to make sure that they've got the right technology and equipment. And, and you could have huge armies that have poor equipment and are under man, they're going to get smoked by a smaller trained force. So size is only one piece, and a lot of people hang their hat on a single uh, factor, size. <clears throat> but what I've said is given the size, capability, readiness uh, of our force, uh, in my view, I've said, I, I said high military risk. So, and that was in testimony uh, recently. I'm sorry. So, high, high. Yeah. Are you willing to take our, but that's not new news. I mean, if you watched the testimony, you would have picked that up, Barbara. <laughs> we just want to get you to explain a little further. Well, I, I did. So I rate, you know, what, what are the piece this parts? This is what we call the follow-up question. No, no, no. What, are, what are the piece parts of risk? It's uh, What's the risk today? Troops. What's the risk today? What's your risk assessment? Relative to what? We can, we can, we have the capabilities. Relative to ISIS. We have the capabilities. Uh, to uh, adequately fight against ISIS uh, without any problem at all. The issues with ISIS are not the capabilities and the size of the force. That, that's not what the issue is with ISIS for us. Uh, the risk to the nation of ISIS, I think, is what you're asking. My, my view, ISIS is, uh, I think they are probably the most capable uh, and vicious terrorist organization in world history. I, I think they're really very, very, very bad. And they're very capable. So when the president 18 months ago said to destroy ISIS, I absolutely sign up to that. They need to be destroyed. Uh, and they are a direct threat to US vital interests, not only in the region, but they have reach so they can reach 
uh, Europe, as they've demonstrated. Uh, and they clearly have aspirations and capability to reach the homeland here in the United States. So ISIS is uh, bad in and of itself, uh, but relative to our interests and our own protection, uh, they have capability, uh, they have intent, they have aspiration, and they need to be destroyed, just like the President told us to do. While they have inspired attacks clearly in the United States, your assessment on their ability to uh, plot, plan, and carry out themselves directly an attack in this country? Um, well, they definitely can plot and plan. Uh, whether or not they can execute, I mean, I have, uh, I have a lot of confidence, hopefully it's not misplaced, I have a lot of confidence in other agencies, CIA, FBI, uh, Customs, Border Patrol, et cetera. Uh, and we are very fortunate, uh, every American is very fortunate at the great work uh, that those folks uh, are doing uh, in an unnamed way every single day, day in and day out, to protect the American people. So I think our defenses are pretty good. But no defense is 100%. And uh, these guys, ISIS, uh, like I said, they have capability and they have intent. Uh, and they're going to continue to bang away until they get in here until we destroy them. So we need to destroy them. We need to uh, get on with it and get them gone. When you look ahead and we start thinking of your questions, we're going to start in just a few minutes on questions. But when you look ahead now to the future, everything you've laid out, talk to us for a minute about technology. Um, one could make a case very briefly that the military there have been some technical changes, but essentially is fighting with the same kit that it had uh, right. to a large yeah. extent when Desert Storm. Look ahead. What do you see in Army land warfare in terms of new technologies, cyber, robotics, whatever? Right. Yeah. So I break the, the future into a couple of chunks of time uh, for uh, my analysis and, and the guidance I've given the Army staff. So, uh, but first of all, you've got to start with with uh, the nature of war and the character of war, which sometimes those are synonyms a lot of people use. The nature of war is basically immutable. It's, it's probably not going to change. It's all about war. is all about politics, always has been. Uh, so it's about imposing your political will through the use of violence on some opponent. Uh, it's all about friction, chance, and all the things that guys like Clausewitz and Sun Tzu always talked about, right? So that's those truisms, if you will, they're going to stay the same. That's the nature of war. What changes all the time is the character of war. And that's based on organizations and training and your national political construct and technology. Technology is usually one of the big drivers of the change of character war. So as I look forward, I see a chunk of time for ground warfare, not air or maritime uh, or space or cyber in those domains. But for ground warfare, I see uh, between now and about five to 10 years from now, which is essentially the budget cycles of the U.S. government, the FIDEPs. Um, I think that we in ground warfare have a set of legacy systems that realistically are going to be improved at the margins uh, and you're not going to see fundamental change in the character of ground warfare. Fundamental change. And what do I mean by that? I mean uh, to go from the smoothbore musket to the rifled musket was a fundamental change. To go from uh, the horse cavalry to the tank or mechanized forces, fundamental change. The introduction of radio communications, fundamental changes. So I don't see fundamental change in the nature or the, or the character of ground warfare in, say, the next five years, 10 years, that range. But when you get beyond 10 years, I do see that. I see fundamental change. So if you look at technologies that are out there, in the area of, uh, uh, of mobility is a great one because you know robotics is making great advances in the commercial world. There's military application. We're already using robotics. That's what drones and UAVs are, robots of, of a sort, some of remote control. Uh, but you could, I can envision a force, a, a ground force, uh, sometime 10, 15 years from now, uh, where a lot of your convoys, your resupply, your logistics, all that stuff where we expose soldiers to IEDs, et cetera, that those are done by robots. Those vehicles are autonomous vehicles. You load them up with ammunition and chow and so on, and you plug in the grids and boom, off they go. Now the domain of ground combat is fundamentally different than air or maritime. It's not as clean, you got the, you got the earth and the surface of the earth, uh, so it's a little bit more complex. So the application of robots to ground combat, we still gotta work through all the problems. 
but it's clear to me that 10 to 15 years from now, robots are going to be a, a very significant component. Then you've got uh, also other things in the area of mobility. You've got fuels, you've got materials. Uh, we're right on the cusp of some really significant material breakthroughs uh, in terms of lightening up armor. Uh, you've got areas of protection, uh, like active protective systems that are out there. Several countries actually are having them, we're developing. Um, in information technology, I mean, that, that thing has been spiraling for a long time, so we've got a lot of areas of information technology. In fact, it's a great vulnerability, is our reliance on space systems and GPS and so on and so forth for our navigation and our precision weapon systems. So you've got a lot of areas of, uh, you know, lethality and shooting. There's a lot of things being done in the world of kinetics right now. Uh, you know, we've been using gunpowder for, I guess, three or four or five hundred years now. <clears throat> so there's things being done in the world of gunpowder where you can take this much gunpowder required to project an artillery shell, and maybe you only need that much gunpowder. And you can automatically see that the implications for logistics, for cost, for the size of your forces, et cetera, are going to be different if that were true. Uh, and we'll see. That, that stuff that's all being tested. There's stuff in lasers, the rail guns that the Navy and Air Force are doing that may have application to the ground. So there's a lot of technologies out there today that we see that are emerging that, in my view, are going to have clear application to ground warfare. And I think, <clears throat> I'm not 100 percent sure, but I am pretty sure uh, that, though the, that some of those technologies are going to change the fundamental character of ground warfare a decade or so from now. Uh, and we've got to lay the, lay the, lay the, uh, you know, the structure down today for the research and development and the acquisition of those systems. I don't know if that answers your question. It does. All right, let's get to some questions from the audience. Um, I'm having a little trouble with the lights, so I think we have microphones out here, um, which we need to get to people. Can, um, and if we don't, we'll just have people st stand up and... Uh, the man from Harvard. He, he okay. went to Harvard. So we'll we'll start right here in the front. He went to the number two school. <laughs> so, well, and I'm very loud, so I'll have to be careful not to be too loud the microphone. And why doesn't everybody say their name and uh, so the general know who's, who he's talking to? Sure. Sidney Friedberg, Breaking Defense, and yes, Harvard, uh, a <laughs> long time ago. Uh, to follow up on a thread about the research, development, acquisition, uh, which you have to start now to get things in 10, 15 years, 20 years, uh, even given how slow the system is, you've submitted a report to Congress in response to their statutory requirement saying, these are changes I am making in the Army acquisition system with the new authorities given to me by law. Uh, these are some changes I would like to see. And as I read it, as people characterize it, it kind of looks like the Army is saying, we'd like to be able to opt out of a lot of oversight. You call it the layering bureaucracy, but it's opting out of a lot of oversight by the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Uh, dot &E testing oversight, Cape Cost Assessment over oversight, and uh, some analysis of alternatives oversight as well. Um, a, am I portraying this fairly? B, why do you need to get out from under this bureaucracy? And C, given the Army's kind of terrible track record at major acquisition programs getting canceled, why do you guys deserve this chance? Um, thank you, Harvard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I'm really glad I picked on you. So, uh, I actually. You would use the phrase opt out of oversight. I wouldn't use that phrase. Uh, because Secretary of Defense uh, and the chains of command always have oversight, uh, just like I always have oversight. Whether or not the rule says X, Y, or Z, you have oversight. If you're the superior headquarters, the way the military works is you always have oversight. And you can never give up that oversight, by the way. So you're always responsible and accountable for that. <clears throat> what I'm asking for, you know, first of all, what's the problem you're trying to solve? We're trying to figure out ways to speed up uh, the acquisition system. Um, some of these systems take multi multiple years, some of them decades, uh, to develop. Uh, so the original requirement, by the time the thing is developed, uh, the commercial sector or the technologies overcome the original requirement to begin with. So you've got some issues in terms of flash to bang, how fast you deliver to market or deliver to the customer. Uh, the, the system or the capability that was originally required to begin with. So the system is slow. And I think anyone out there uh, would argue that the system is slow. 
Why is it slow? Uh, part of it is the layers upon layers upon layers. <clears throat> the famous one that's recent is uh, the pistol, right? So that's a relatively simple technology. It's been around for, I guess, five centuries or so. And we're not exactly redesigning how to go to the moon, right? This is, this is a pistol. Uh, and arguably, it's the least <clears throat> lethal and important weapon system in the Department of Defense inventory, a pistol, right? This thing's been out there for nine years or 10 years. Requirements, 367 page requirement document, why? Well, lawyer says this and lawyer says that, and you have to go through this process and that process. You have to have oversight and you know, this, that, and the other thing. Look at, I, I think that large bureaucratic organizations are, or large organizations, whether bureaucratic or not, I think the best methods of management are to empower and decentralize. Uh, I think that I should be able to look at someone and say, here's your task, here's why you're doing it, here's the purpose, here's the end state that I want you to achieve by such and such a time. Go forth and have at it. If you succeed, you're promoted, and I give you a medal. If you fail, you're fired, and, and, and you hold people accountable. Uh, what you don't do, what large organizations do over and over and over again, is they observe things that are screwed up in the environment, and they take the problem and they centralize it. And they actually make it worse. So I think you empower and you decentralize by using what the Army calls mission command, or Aufstrak Taktik was what the Germans called it way back when, and mission type tactics. It's been called a lot of different things over the years. But you're operating off intent, uh, purpose, and, and you hold people accountable to it. That applies in acquisition just as well as it applies on the battlefield. And that's what I'd like to do. It's not a lack of oversight. I'm not asking to be, you know, hey, you know, free reign, let's go party. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying let me, and then hold me accountable. Let me figure out what type pistol we need and let me go buy it without having to go through nine years of uh, incredible, you know, scrutiny and testing. The, the, the test, I, I took a brief the other day. The testing for this pistol is two years, two years to, pet, to test technology that we know exists. And we're not figuring out you know, the next lunar landing. This is a pistol, two years to test at $17 million, 17 million? I can call Cabela's tonight, you give me 17 million on a credit card, <laughs> I'll call Cabela's tonight and, and I will outfit every soldier, sailor, airman and marine with a pistol for 17 million and I'll get a discount on it for a bulk buy. I mean, come on. So there's a certain degree of common sense to some of this stuff, and that's what I'm talking about, is to empower the service chiefs, not just me, empower the service chiefs with the capabilities to go out and do certain things, to speed the process up, bring the products to, to the point of need, uh, get their firstest with the mostest, and get there fast, sort of thing. That's Let me about. go to this side of the room. Um, you have a microphone over there. The gentleman in the middle there who has his hand up. Um, who I recognize. <laughs> yes, sir, you. Senator Harris, uh, hi, Senator. Um, thank you for your service, sir. There's been a lot of conversation about World War Nichols II. And the conversation is all over the map. Whether it is. Sorry. I was trying to use my outside voice. So there's been a lot of conversation about Goldwater Nichols II in the media and the news, and we've seen this before over the years. And it goes all over the map, from how many COCOMs, how big they should be, what the joint staff uh, should be responsible for, more or less. Where do you think, what do you think the objectives for any change to Goldwater Nichols II should be? And where do you think the conversation ought to lead? Because right now it's all over the map. Over. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think there's an awful lot of ideas and proposals out there. <clears throat> um, you know, I've got a group that are, uh, of folks that are helping me think through all the various uh, op options that are out there, and the uh, Department of Defense has some, and uh, the House and Senate each have a variety of proposals. Uh, so trying to work through all of it, uh, more complicated than people may fully realize. Uh, I think that uh, one of the bigger issues out there that people seem to talk about a lot um, is the role of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, and the role of the Chairman. Uh, you know, questions like should the Chairman be in the chain of command, shouldn't the Chairman be in the chain of command? Uh, what's the role of the Joint Staff? How should they be organized, structured? Uh, that's out there. I, I, I haven't formed 
uh, all my you know, sort of conclusions yet. I've got some time uh, remaining before I have to sort of declare myself uh, and give my recommendations and my thoughts. But that's one of the bigger issues is that one. Uh, another one is the role of COCOMs, combatant commands. So we've had <coughs> combatant commands uh, for quite some time. Is it the right way to organize uh, the U.S. military or not? Uh, there are issues associated with that. There's issues associated any time you put boundaries between organizations. Uh, so that's, you know, our, our combatant commands, <coughs> are they uh, uh, more a Paul Mill type headquarters or are they a fighting headquarters? Now, what's the role of joint task forces in, in fighting? Uh, so that all gets in there. The uh, size, uh, size of headquarters, bureaucratic oversight uh, has, uh, has led to the expansion and explosion, literally, of the sizes of headquarters. If you go back to World War II, Admiral Nimitz, commander of the Central Pacific, uh, he started off with about 300, and I think he ended up with about 900 uh, folks on his staff, and he fought Imperial Japan across the Central Pacific, actually won, and he did it in 36 months. So. <clears throat> not a bad record for a relatively small, nimble staff there for Admiral Nimitz. Uh, and other staffs were similar, not just his. Uh, today, we have very large staffs uh, throughout. Uh, there's reasons for it. A lot of it uh, was already mentioned in a previous question. So though, that's another big area, though, is the proliferation, the tooth-to-tail ratio, number of generals, et cetera. So you're correct. The, the areas are all over the place. But I think those three in particular uh, probably loom larger than others. Of course, acquisition reform is another big one, for the role of the service chiefs. There's a whole series of issues out there. As uh, you look at all of this, do you think there's too much or not enough emphasis on the use of special operations forces today? Well, I think there's uh, a series of myths about warfare uh, that are prevalent, uh, and they're particularly seductive. Uh, to Americans or to democracies. Uh, one of those myths is that special forces can do it all. Uh, they can't. They're not designed to do it all. They're not trained to do it all. Uh, and, nor, and, the, and the pros in special forces will be the first ones to tell you, they can't do it all. Uh, special forces is dependent uh, upon other architectures that are out there that come from not only conventional army, but Navy, Air Force, Marines, uh, and so on. So sp special forces as a palliative sort of the silver bullet is a pot of gold. It's a, it's a false, it's a myth uh, in the conduct of warfare. Uh, so I'm always wary of just that. Uh, the first question you have to ask, I think, is uh, are you at war or not? So special forces can do raids, high value targets, uh, and they can provide extraordinarily capable uh, and useful actions in the conduct of war. But if you're at war, then your task is to impose your political will on your opponent through the use of violence. That's what war is. Um, and that is not what Special Forces is designed to do. Imposing your political will, controlling territory, controlling people, imposing your will through the use of violence on an opponent, that's what war is. So if we say you're at war, it doesn't, the Army doesn't do it either. It's not Special Forces, it's not the Army, it's not the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, in and of themselves, none of them. It's the synergistic effect of all of them together in time and space. So we're at war by national definition of the political leadership. We are at war with ISIS. We want to defeat, the US wants to defeat and destroy ISIS. Mm. Is enough military power using tools of violence being applied to ISIS. Bluntly, is it going to take ground troops to get ISIS defeated? Well, I mean, we're going to find out. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm not trying to be coy, but um, well, I don't know what we, that we means. Modified, we modified the, uh, the campaign uh, that's being carried out. You're seeing some of the results uh, of that uh, play out in the news. Um, and since we modified it back in the fall, uh, there's been a series of actions that have taken place that have uh, clearly had uh, positive outcomes in terms of territory that was taken, uh, uh, the amount of uh, attrition applied to the enemy, the pressure on the leadership, et cetera. So, but that's just, that's not winning, and it's not over. So we have to see how it plays out 
in the months ahead, and we'll have to reassess. Your answer is not known yet. Does it require ground troops or not? And ground troops, um, then you get into who ground troops, which ground troops. Um, putting in American ground troops is one question. Putting in, uh, you know, having, say, Sunni Arab countries ground troops is a different question. Uh, so we'll see which way it goes. I don't want to, I, I know he's trying to get me to say, but I'm not going to do it. So uh, <laughs> we'll see it. But I will say that if you go back to the basic question, um, are you at war? Uh, if, that, if the answer to that question is yes. With uh, ISIS. All right, if you're at war with ISIS, if that answer is yes, then there are certain requirements based on the logic of war that more or less have to be done uh, sooner or later. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, we'll see which way this goes. Or we'll, we'll know soon enough. Let's go back to this side of the room. Um, sir, right there. Uh, if, and I'll just caution everybody, although this is all f fascinating, we're about five minutes out from having to wrap up. Joel Garrow with ASU in New America. Uh, I was struck by your comment that there was no fundamental uh, change to war that you expected in the next 10 years. Um, no fundamental change. Fundamental. Yes. I mean, that word means something to me. And fundamental to ground war, not to war, but to ground war. OK. Yeah. I'm interested in uh, biotechnology and especially CRISPR-Cas9 ability to transform any life form you wish cheaply and uh, efficiently if you're a half bright grad student in a reasonably well-equipped bio lab today. Uh, that seems to offer astonishing asymmetric power to anybody who cares to harness this from almost any direction. What is your expectation of um, bioengineering, especially as regards to transforming humans, either offensively or defensively? Um. There's research uh, on man-machine interfacing, on uh, the interaction between man and machine. I think Peter Singer's here. He's written some books on some of this stuff. Uh, there's a lot of research on it. My point about the next 10 years, I do not see the research advanced enough to have a practical application to military operations on the ground in the next 10 years. I'm not seeing the reality of it. The possibilities there, there's research out there on all these, on that and many, many more things. Uh, but what I'm talking about in terms of that time frame, I'm not seeing that reality where we have it in the hands of soldiers and it's, and it's real on a battlefield in the next 10 years for ground war. There's certainly peace parts to it. But we're already doing things, you know, in the medical world, uh, in treatment of casualties, there's a lot of research been done. We're already applying some of that stuff. In, in information technology and protection. We're, we're taking piece parts of these technologies and applying them right now. But fundamental change, widespread application, changing the character of ground warfare, I, I, I'm not seeing that. I mean, it's taken us nine years to figure out how to do a pistol, so I don't see why, why would I? Let me have one last question from this side of the room. Sir, right here in front. Yes, sir. Uh, we may not, I don't know if we need the microphone. We do for everyone to hear. I'll give 30 second answers. You can do three questions. All right. One doesn't say no to General seconds. Milley. You can time it. Good morning. My name is Michael Hushdishan from the U.S. Agency for International Development, Office of Civilian and Military Cooperation. And many today uh, posit that in today's increasingly complex and unpredictable operational environment, we need a comprehensive approach in order to solve the challenges to our national security. General, I'd be interested in your views what the priority areas are for collaboration with other agencies within our interagency. I mean, I couldn't agree more. I think you have to have a whole of government interagency approach, and I think it's beyond that. I think it involves uh, international partners as well. Uh, the military is only one tool. USAID is yet another. The CIA, Intel, uh, Department of State has a variety of other capabilities. Uh, I think you have to bring it all together. Uh, I, I don't think uh, what, uh, in terms of actual war fighting, uh, it's not the Army. It's the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines. It's cyber, it's space. It's bringing all that together in time and space. To win a war takes a nation, and it takes the synergy of all of these agencies. And, and frankly, to win a war, it probably takes an alliance. And it takes the synergy of everyone uh, working together to achieve the political end state. So I absolutely agree with you. All right, let's have, ma'am, right here. I see you. Stand up. We're running out of time. Now you're hard. <laughs> 
I don't want Peter to have to give us both the hook publicly. Sure. Ulrike Frank, University of Oxford. Um, what role do you see for drones and robots in any hypothetical conventional high-intensity war, both within the next five to ten years, but also within the next 15 years? And what systems and capabilities do you think we should focus on now? This, uh, and we're already using drones, as you say, are unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, and they come in kind of two varieties. One is controlled, someone with a control stick, and another is autonomous. <clears throat> so there's already robotics out on the battlefields today. We're using them in explosive ordnance disposal and stuff like that. But the large scale application of the use of robots for ground combat, one area that I think is very promising is specifically the area of logistics. <clears throat> because we spend, an, uh, any modern army has a, a re relatively robust logistical tail. Uh, for fuel, ammunition, food, water, etc. And you have to carry that from point A to point B. And, uh, and when you get it, you know, get it close to front line sort of thing, or, or even if there's no front lines in a particular war, like a guerrilla war in, uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, you're exposing your own forces. Uh, and then also it takes a lot of protection, uh, convoy protection forces, etc. So if we can use robots to deliver that stuff, uh, then I'm certainly not exposing ourselves to casualties, and it reduces the amount of protection that I need to, uh, to, to uh, secure those convoys. So logistics would be one area that I'm taking a hard look at. I can envision someday convoys of unmanned vehicles full of ammunition and chow and so on, bringing things from uh, some rare area to wherever it is you have soldiers that need to be resupplied. All right, I'm going to apologize. We are getting the hook. Uh, we are out of time. Um, right, Peter? Well, yes, Peter says I'm getting the hook. Uh, I want to thank General Milley. I think I, everyone here can agree this is, why, um, this is why when General Milley's out speaking in public, the Pentagon press corps turns up, because General Milley is always worth listening to, and we always learn something. Sir, thank you very much for your time. <laughs>